What are your next five moves? Tune into this episode of Title Talk, where we interview serial entrepreneur Patrick Bed David, the CEO of PHP Agency and the founder of Valuetainment has over 2 million subscribers on YouTube, every video you can think of on being a successful entrepreneur like you. So check this video out, give me some likes and some love, let me know if you liked it, and I look forward to seeing you on another episode. Hope you enjoyed today's show. Patrick, welcome to the show today. Thanks for having me on. Oh, we appreciate you taking the time. I know you have a busy schedule. So I have a couple of questions for you. The first one I wanted to talk about, because I'm always curious to know myself, the kind of the Reader's Digest version of who is Patrick, but more importantly, why Valuetainment? Who is Patrick? So I was born and raised in Iran, lived there 10 years. Six weeks after Khomeini died, we escaped. We went to Germany, lived at a refugee camp for a year and a half. Then I came to the States, uh, served the U.S. Army, got out, started working at Morgan Stanley Dean Witter a day before 9-11, and then started my own, uh, went to Transamerica for seven and a half years, and then started our own uh, insurance agency on uh, September 23rd of uh, 2009. It became official on October 20th of 09 with one office out of Northridge, California, 66 insurance agents. And today we have over 15,000 in 49 states, 130 plus offices, a half a million square feet. And uh, De La Hoya and a bunch of other guys are investors in the company. And that's the business side. Now, Valuetainment, uh, you know, I was creating content but on private and unlisted. Nothing the public would see. It was specifically for the company I was running. And one day, one of my guys said, why don't you start creating content publicly? We started doing one episode a week. It was called Two Minutes with Pat. Two years later, I said, uh, I want to change the channel and go to one word. And the one word that I wanted to talk about, which I'm uh, pretty good at, is business and entrepreneurship. We chose the word entrepreneur and then changed the channel to Valuetainment. And then from there, the rest is history. Unbelievable. It's an unbelievable show. One thing that I think is so unique about you, and I talk about it to everyone, is that when we watch your videos pretty much every single day, sometimes twice a day, it's never soliciting anything. It's just literally adding as much entrepreneurial value to the people watching. So kudos to you for doing that. Thank you. Uh, I watch it religiously every day, usually on my drive to work. I know now they're a little bit later in the afternoon sometimes. Uh, my two favorite, one is the interview with Sammy the Bull. I have a great connection with Sammy. Actually, I met him uh, 15 years ago. I actually took him for dinner at Charlie's Steakhouse in um, Scottsdale, Arizona. He was known as Jimmy then. That was when he was actually in witness protection. Uh, and I had a great opportunity to take him for dinner. And he signed my book. And, uh, you know, it was just nice to be able to listen. You know, you may or may not agree with things that he did, but just some of the life lessons that they talk about are just so important. But it's not really to talk about him, but more to talk about my favorite episode, which is where you cover the difference between an entrepreneur, an intrapreneur, and a solopreneur. Now, we have a, uh, we're affiliated with a very large real estate company here in South Florida called Charles Ruttenberg Realty, which was just uh, acquired and merged with a large company called United Real Estate Group, which ironically is right down the street from you, just south of um, I 635. Uh, so we have about 6,000 agents in the organization. So can you speak a little bit to them? Because most of them are not entrepreneurs because they're single real estate agents, real estate investors. Maybe the difference in something that, that they can have value by watching this. Yeah. So listen, I never wanted to be an entrepreneur. My, my uh, desire was to be an entrepreneur. Right now I'm listening to the book of uh, uh, Bob Iger, the CEO of uh, Disney. And he talks about how uh, uh, one of his dreams was to be the CEO of Disney. And he used to work for ABC and then Disney bought ABC and ABC was complicated. And Eisner at the time was running Disney and he didn't know how to handle uh, ABC of how complicated it was to deal with the shows and sports, ESPN, all that stuff. And then he eventually ends up becoming the CEO of uh, Disney, I think, for 15 something years. And uh, 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 he may be even coming back or currently one, but he wanted to be the CEO of Disney. I wanted to be a CEO of a large financial firm. I had no desire to want to start my own business. I, I wanted to stay and be a leader there and then eventually own a piece, equity, all that other stuff. But the company I work with didn't offer that, so I eventually left. There are benefits to being entrepreneurs. There are benefits to become entrepreneurs. An entrepreneur to me is somebody that thinks, works, acts. Everything he does is like an entrepreneur. Everything. People leave at 5 o'clock and entrepreneur never leaves at 5 o'clock. People get in at nine o'clock and entrepreneur never gets in at nine o'clock. 
People decide to be casual and take three-hour lunches, and entrepreneur doesn't take a three-hour lunch. People decide to go out there and you know spend the entire weekend kicking back, and entrepreneur doesn't do that. Uh, you know, if somebody wants to one day get the kind of respect that an entrepreneur makes, or make the kind of money an entrepreneur makes within a company, you got to act, walk, work, talk, everything you do like an entrepreneur. So one is finding a com- company that allows you to breed entrepreneurs. The other one is to think like an entrepreneur. You know, Steve Ballmer was never an entrepreneur. He was simply an employee of Microsoft and eventually ended up becoming a CEO. And today he's worth $59.1 billion as an entrepreneur. Then he ended up buying the Clippers. Then he ended up buying other businesses. But the founder, he's not a founder. He was an entrepreneur. So there are a lot of good benefits to be an entrepreneur, especially if you can work under somebody that you can shadow who's already successful and you take all their secrets, their codes, they share everything with you. And then a year, two years, three years, five years, 10 years later, you say, listen, I've been here for five years. I've shown you I'm uh, loyal to you. I love the company. I love what we're doing. What can I do to participate in profit sharing or equity at the highest level? And then at that moment, depending on the kind of value you've created for that company, they get to say yes or they get to say no. And then if they say no, then you have the choice to go become an entrepreneur. So that's my biggest uh, suggestion to entrepreneurs out there. Unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's a lot of people, they're running their own business and a lot of them are working. Like I was a firefighter and I worked for a very large hotel chain and I did everything I can do as if I own the hotel and eventually moved all the way up the ranks. I was the director of fire safety working in Times Square and moved down to from New York 20 days before 9-11. So I probably would have been there and, and been pretty high up in, in what I was doing. Um, so, you know, it's, it's always about giving that added value to the people you're working for and, and to get that, that extra opportunity. Uh, you talk a lot about sports. You have a huge love for sports. And I loved your video the other day talking about the 23 lessons from the last dance. We don't have time to cover all 23. But one of the things that really struck me was you talked about the quote where you said only a lion speaks the language of another lion. So I love to surround myself with lions. Can you just elaborate a little bit about, you know, what the the real estate agent or the investor can actually do to speak the language of another lion as opposed to the opposite? Well, lions are uh, uh, unreasonable about winning. Lions are not necessarily the most empathetic and sympathetic to uh, uh, people who say it's hard to build a business, it's hard with the rejections, they're very sympathetic and empathetic when somebody dies, funeral, when there's a health or injury or something that's going on. I totally understand it, but not for people who are always uh, blaming, making excuses, acting like victims. They get under the lion's skin. The lion has no time for people like that. Lions uh, see things. They enter a restaurant and they look out and they look at things and say, okay, this company and this restaurant could be doing this better, that better, this better. What if they did this? What if they did that? A lion looks at a talent and says, this guy can be a lion, but does he really want to be a lion? Does he want to think like one? Does he want to go drive like one? This guy has got the capacity to be a leader and do some big things, but does he really want to go through the pain that a lion needs to go through? So that's that part. Now, there's the other side as well where, you know, some people are not meant to be lions. It's very, very important to understand that. You know, in the game, uh, in the in the uh, documentary, The Last Dance, Jordan's the lion, obviously. You know, and everybody responded to the king of the jungle, who was Jordan. You know, Horace Grant tried to get that kind of a respect, where he was upset when one time Jordan and Pippen came back from the Olympics, and you know they were doing one dayers practice, and Phil Jackson said, Horace, you got to do two dayers, and he's like, Wait a minute, why am I doing two dayers and they're doing one dayers? And Phil said, they played in the Olympics on the Dream Team, and you didn't. They've been playing this entire season. You have not. And he was upset. He was a guy that wanted to be treated like a lion, but he hadn't earned the right, and it bothered him. So sometimes people have a hard time where they want the respect of a lion, but you just are not, you know, at the level of a lioness to be able to get that kind of a respect. You know, it's it's tough. It's very complex because lions tend to create a lot of enemies. Lions tend to create a lot of opposition. Lions tend to get under people's skins. Lions tend to create others who have envy. Lions tend to create opposition with jealousy. Lions tend to, you know, wake people up who had forgotten about them and come back and say, well, I'm going to do whatever I can to spite that person. But the a true lion uh, anticipates that and understands that that comes with the platform and the next level they want to play at. 
and then is comfortable entering that arena versus some people say, oh, no, 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 no. I don't want that kind of opposition. I don't want people to be upset at me. I, I don't want that because who wants to live a life like that? I don't want to live a life like that. I want everybody to like me. Totally get it. A lion says you're not a lion. Totally understand it. It's not for everybody, but it's for a few people. And at the end of the day, you know, I was reading this um, documentary about uh, Churchill the other day, and I want to read this one part to you. Uh, uh, which is very interesting. It's a you know thousand page book, one of those books that if you want to read it, it's annoying because it takes you a while to go through it. But here's what it says at the end of the chapter about the guy. Uh, you know, he loved his friends, many of whom died early, most of whom he rode with a sum of a stage or other loyalty. He viscerally hated Lenin, Trotsky, Hitler, but remarkably few others. Churchill was supremely egotistical, instinctively combative and prone to deliberate exaggeration, and he consistently underestimated the negative impression that these traits made on people. Let me read that again. So Churchill was supremely egotistical, instinctively combative, prone to deliberate exaggeration, and he consistently underestimated the negative impression that these traits made on people. What does that mean? Jordan had a very big ego, okay? And Jordan wanted to kill everybody. He wanted to compete. But he didn't necessarily see the negative impact it was going to have on him years later. Look at how many people right now are coming out and saying, terrible documentary, it was horrible, it was all about Jordan, and I can't stand what he said. Well, that makes sense. And when a, when a lion comes out and gets credit for being a lion, and the rest don't, the rest get upset. But Stephen A. Smith said it best. Stephen A. Smith said, why is everybody pissed off? He says, do you actually think we would watch The Last Dance if it wasn't about Michael Jordan? Do you actually think we're going to watch it if it was about you? We want to watch The Last Dance because the story's about the greatest of all time, which is Michael Jordan. So now, some people watch this and they say, well, Pat, that kind of uh, undermines me. You know, uh, why would I want to go out there and give my best if I can never be like a Mike? It's not the point. Pippen isn't the documentary. And Pippen is a top 50 greatest player of all time. Pippen is somebody that Jordan gave a ton of credit that he would have never won six championships without him. Phil Jackson is in the documentary. Jerry Krause is in the documentary. Jerry the owner is in the documentary. Meaning, when the team wins, when the team wins, when a country like America wins, yes, we talk about, you know, George Washington, but you got Jefferson, Smith, Benjamin Rush, Franklin. There's so many other people also that when sometimes people uh, are hurting a team from winning, what they end up hurting the most is their own ability to be remembered in the history books. Just because somebody's getting a little bit more credit than you do, who cares? You're going to be written about in the history books. You can do something small and be the main guy in a small thing, but no one's going to remember you. You can be part of something big and be able to say, I ran with somebody like that. Guess what? They're going to write about you as well, because without you, it also wouldn't happen. So it's a very complex issue. And the uh, Lions are some of the most under. What's the best word? Um, misunderstood personalities out there. But history likes to write about them and people love to read about them. I love it. It makes me appreciate the hard work my wife and I put in. We have multiple companies across uh, three countries and, and you know, almost 100 employees. And, and we work so hard. It's always work. We go home and it's work. And, and, and it's just, you know, it's about being that lion and constantly pushing forward. And, and like I said, some people may hate you for it. But in the end, you're doing what's right and you're going to be the one that's remembered. So um, thank you for that. So you have a new book coming out. It's titled Your Next Five Moves. Your quote says, every victory, every loss, everything you do in life will boil down to your next five moves. Now, we don't have time for all five, but can you tell us a little bit about the book and maybe one little nugget that uh, they can take away for it? And by the way, we did buy a bunch of copies. We're going to be handing them out to some of our best clients when it comes out. And I encourage everyone to visit Pat's website and pre-order this book. Yeah. So look, for me, you know, uh, the book, Your Next Five Moves, is a byproduct of what I've done my entire life. Meaning, I got out of the military, I sat down and I came up with my 2020-2020 plan. It's four 20s. And the first 20 was, don't make a lot of mistakes, big mistakes. Meaning, make mistakes, try stuff, go party, try different women, try different this, try, but just don't get arrested, don't get somebody pregnant you don't want to get, protectors, all of that stuff, right? Try to not make the big, don't get a felony, do whatever you can to not make any of the bigger mistakes. Now, it happens to some of us, 
But that was my first 20, and God knows I made a lot of mistakes, but I got lucky with some of them that I never got arrested for. Second 20 years is putting everything I have to one thing. And it's, it's very confusing to a lot of people here because some people think, hey, go monetize your passion and go make money with your passion. Pursue your passion. You will never work a single day in your life. My passion are people. I love people is what I am. So when I went to the second thing that I did, and I said, I'm going to do it for two year, 20 years. It was financial industry. I got started the day before 9-11, which is uh, 19 years ago. And I said, I'm going to go 20 years. My 20 years is coming up next 2021, September, that I'll do 20 years. During the entire time of us doing what we did, I uh, went through deciding on how I was going to build my insurance agency and what the industry was missing. We took a deep dive and looked at the marketplace. And I saw Ron Paul was a guy that was running for presidency, I think in 01, he raised $6 million on social media in 24 hours. It was like a Guinness Book of World Record. When that happened, a one-term senator noticed he did that out of, Chicago, out of Illinois, Lincoln Park. And the guy who he noticed was who? A guy named Barack Obama. Barack Obama said, if Ron Paul can raise $6 million on social media in 24 hours, I can raise billions. That's exactly what he did. He became a two-term president. By the way, you take social media out, President Obama is probably not the president, just so everybody knows. And if you take Twitter out, Donald Trump's probably not the president. Donald Trump used Twitter as his number one tool to become a president, number one tool to become a president. So I'm sitting there and I'm watching everything taking place in the insurance industry. And I said, Pat, if you were to do something today, what would be your next five to 15 moves? And that's exactly what we did. The average agent was a 57-year-old white male. I said, our average agent's going to be a 33-year-old Hispanic female which is completely confusing to the industry. The average insurance company doesn't do anything on social media. We're going to go out the market the hell out of social media, which is what we did. Yeah, and I looked at every single thing and I mapped out our, our, our points on what we were going to do next. And then eventually that led to being where we are today. The same thing with the YouTube channel. When I started looking at everybody creating content, I said, here's where we're going to differentiate ourselves. And then we created our next moves, 15 moves, just like a chess player. Too often, uh, uh, Kevin, this is what happens. Too often people want to make move number 19 on move number three, and they screw the whole thing up. Too often you'll have people that have good intentions, but they're making an aggressive move way too early instead of being a little bit patient. This book, Your Next Five Moves, is simply showing you a formula of how for you to come out with the right sequence of your next five, 10, 15 moves to be able to do exactly what you want to do in your life, in your marriage, in your business, in every single area. Yesterday I was talking to one of my C-suite executives, and I took him out and I said, listen, have you already prepared for the day that I'm not going to be here? He says, what do you mean? Husband and wife, they're both very important people in our company. So what do you mean? I said, are you prepared to know that maybe I'm not going to be here very soon? What are your next moves? And I said, well, we've talked about it. I said, but what are you going to be doing long term? Tell me about your moves. Well, what about this? And what about that? I said, I think you guys got to really start talking about what your next moves are going to be. Well, what if this happens? What do we do? I said, that's exactly part of next five moves. I mean, if this happens, we do the next five things. But if this happens, we do the next five things. But if this happens, I said, have you done that? No. Anybody that I've met in my career that has succeeded and has made a lot of money in business or done very well in anything else that has to do with leadership and strategy or military, anybody, one of the things they all have in common is they are very good at making the right next five moves. And again, uh, if we're living at a time right now, maybe the most uh, uh, unpredictable times ever during our lifetime in the U.S. If there's ever been a time where you need to know your next five moves more than ever, it's today. So that's why uh, I wrote the book, and I'm excited that we decided to team up with Simon and Schuster. And the book comes out on August 18th. But uh, those who don't have the book yet till 18, they can get a copy of a chapter, chapter three. Uh, if they purchase a book and they go to yournextfivemoves.com, they pick up a book, they'll be able to. Uh, get a chapter themselves. But yeah, that's why I wrote the book, Your Next Five Moves. Awesome. You have time for one more quick question? Yeah, absolutely. So, so I follow a ton of your stuff online. Like I said before, you have lots of fun. We have a lot of stuff in common, uh, like your helicopter ride over in, in Fort Lauderdale. And you, you just, you really embrace and enjoy life being such a busy person. So I wake up myself 5 a.m. every day. I train with the U.S. Marine, one of the hardest workouts I've ever done. I lost 85 pounds. I'm in the best shape of my life at 42 years old have a successful business. So one of the things that I want to talk about, and maybe you can elaborate a little bit, is what does routine have to do with success? And then tie that into how someone as successful as you prioritizes 
what you do on a daily, weekly, monthly basis, you know, summarize it to be more successful and take your business to another level. That's that's such a Bobby, congratulations on the 85 pounds. That is not an easy thing to do. And it's very obvious your energy is very high. Whatever you're doing right now, it's effective Thank and you. it's working for you. But, you know, uh, uh, years ago, I was sitting down and people were asking me, Pat, the uh, what do you think helps somebody become the best at what they do or compete for number one in, in our business financial industry? What helps you compete to be number one? I said, look, it's a, it's a basic four formula that you don't need to be intimidated by another competitor. Because I noticed a lot of guys were afraid of a guy or they were afraid of somebody or another small business or any of that stuff. And one time I'm 26 years old. When I figured out this formula, I went to this guy. Never forget this. He's 6'5". I'm 6'4 and a half, 6'5". We're both big guys. He's bald. I wasn't at the time. And I, I went up to him and he was the number one guy in the company. And I met him in Phoenix, Arizona. I just I just flew out there to face him. And I was going to tell him, I want you to know, you will never build a business as big as mine. Now, that's arrogant. That's pompous. That's everything you want to say under the, you know, it absolutely is. There's no question about it. I was a 26-year-old, arrogant, confident, cocky, whatever you want to call it. But a bigger part of me saying that to him was the pressure for me to see how I was going to react. So I come back and I sit down and I remember when I was 14 years old at a gym working out, a guy named Fred told me when I was 6'1", 135, a toothpick. When I went into the gym, I was so embarrassed because I was so skinny. I was wearing three shirts, so embarrassed. He says, don't worry about everybody else being bigger than you. He says, you see this? This is your best friend. I said, what is that? He says, this is two and a half pounds. He said, every single week when you bench press, just add two and a half pounds to the bar and that's all you need to worry about. He said, and then increase it. So I started off doing the bar, 45 pounds. Next week, 45 pounds and two and a half. Next week, you get the idea until eventually I'm benching 385. I'm curling 90-pound dumbbells. That principle stuck with me. So you asked the question about routine. I have four things that I follow. One is outwork. You got to outwork your peers, but that's not enough. Number two is you got to out-improve your peers. Speed. You got to out-improve them, but that's not enough. Number three is you got to out-strategize your peers, master the art of business strategy. So what do we have so far? You got to outwork, but it's not, that's not enough. Out-improve, but that's not enough. Out-strategize, but that's not enough. The last one ended up becoming a one that brought it all together. And that's outlast. Outlast your peers. When there is a dogfight in a business, in sports, fourth quarter, you know, military, somehow, some way, the guy that can hang and tolerate pain longer tends to win. It's just how things work. The person that can outlast his or her peers, you can't beat that person. And by the way, that person is very, very annoying. I got a call from one of my competitors, and this guy called me. He used to be the, the guy at, at a company. He makes very, by the way, he's financially free today, has an incredible life, does very well for himself. I respect the life he's built for his wife and his kids. But I knew years ago when I sat down across the table from this guy in Hawaii and I told him, I said, I want you to know something. I said, I think you're done. I said, I don't think you love this game. I said, I just think you want it to be financially free. He says, you're right. That's what I wanted. I said, you see, the difference with me is I didn't get into this game to just be a millionaire or be financially free. That's the byproduct. I'm living in America. If I don't make millions in America, what the hell am I doing if I'm in America? I understand if I'm in Iran. I understand if I'm in a different country. But if you don't become a millionaire in America, you're simply not taking advantage of the benefits that America gives you. So he says, so what's your point? I said, I want to compete and build something that's never been built before. I'm not in it for the money. That's easy stuff. I want to do something big. He says, fine. I leave. He calls me. We have a conversation together. He says, hey, Pat, you know what? I got a question for you. He said, yes. He says, how do you create content, research your guests to ask technical questions, have a wife and three kids? Do your best to keep your marriage together, which is one of the hardest things to do in life, especially for a personality like mine. Have your kids at the office every day. My son is here right now. They switch. He makes his shots, 104 shots a day he's got to make. He's got to read his 20 pages. He's got to read the documentary I choose, and then he can do whatever he wants to do during coronavirus. He says, then you go on these board calls. Then you go raise tens of millions of dollars. Then you write a book. Then you stay in shape. Then you work out. Then you call your friends. How do you do all that stuff? I said, uh-huh, great question. I said, here's the difference. Because I subscribed to a vision, and this was my formula. And my formula was to get to a point where my competitors eventually say, damn, that freaking guy is just not going to stop. 
and eventually you stop competing. That's victory. Psychological winning is victory, where your competition says, look, we'll compete with everybody, just not that freaking weird guy. And then they'll say things like, well, you know, it's not like he's happy. You think he really likes his life. I mean, who would want to have a life like his? Would you want to work that hard? And would you want to really go through? I think secretly he's not happy. He's probably hypomanic or, you know, all this other stuff. He probably all good. All I know is that's the decision that was made. So routine, a routine is a byproduct of you being able to constantly outwork, out improve, out strategize and outlast. And if you do that, if there is anything that can pretty much guarantee success for you is these four basic formulas. It's nothing sexy. It's nothing crazy. It's just proven. Unbelievable. Yeah. Like I said, I moved down from, from New York before 9-11 and, and I was doing like 30 closings a month. And then we went down to three closings a month and I did everything I could just to hold on, outsmart everyone, outthink everyone, outwork everyone, think like a lion. And then we built it up to where we were doing 125 closings a month. And, and it's those principles that I think created our success moving forward because we just continue doing it. We don't stop our competitors. I meet with them regularly. They love what we do, but they know that they want to duplicate and replicate what we're doing because they know it works. They know it's successful and we have a great presence. So thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking a little extra time with us. For those of you watching, go out and get this book. It doesn't come out till August. You can download a chapter on the website, but pre-order this book. This book is going to blow your mind and create uh, what I was going to say before, but I forgot your blueprint, your blueprint, because we know during an election season, we're probably not going to have any type of major economic downturn. But maybe next year, maybe after that, we're going to see some type of reset in the real estate market. So get your blueprint in order now. So this way you can survive anything when it comes your way. So, Pat, thank you so much for taking the time. I love watching your stuff online. You'll see me comment all the time. Uh, I'm watching it. I'm watching what you're doing. You're inspiring me. You're inspiring the people around me. So thank you so much. Appreciate you for having me, buddy. By the way, big respect to you for uh, losing 85 pounds and taking the sales from 30 to 30 to 3 to back to 110. Big stuff right there. Keep it up. Thank you, my friend. All right, everyone. Tune in next week for another great interview. Thank you for watching. Don't forget, work hard, stay focused, never quit, stay healthy, and we'll see you on the next interview. Have a great day, everyone.